This conference will now be recorded. All right. Mark, it's all you. All right, I guess we can get going, even though I'm hearing a lot of dings there. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm Mark Silos. I'm one of the Northern Directors of the California Lake Management Society. We're a chapter of the North American Lake Management Society. And thank you all for tuning into our second quarterly webinar of 2020. This is record attendance for us by far, and I'm going to go ahead and tastefully not attribute that to the COVID pandemic <laughs> and just say that we're growing in popularity, which is great. Um, just to let you guys know, the webinar and the question and answer session at the end is going to be recorded. And we're really honored to present Keith Boomer Gregson today. Keith is one of the co-leads of the State Water Board's Freshwater Harmful Algal Bloom Program. And he completed his PhD at UC Berkeley in 2017, studying toxic cyanobacterial mats in the Eel River of Northern California. He's trained in cyanobacterial ecology and genomics and began working with the Water Board in January 2019. So I'm gonna turn it over to Stephen really quickly and he's gonna go over some brief housekeeping and then we can turn it over to Keith. Yep. Thanks, Mark. So, uh, yeah, this is Stephen McCord. We're using my um, GoToMeeting account. Uh, this is by far the largest number of people we've had. So if there's little hiccups in it, then apologize for that. But maybe you're used to it now. A couple of things to point out if you haven't used GoToMeeting. If you scroll down towards the bottom of your uh, the, the window that's open, you'll see my camera screen and maybe leave. Uh, definitely um, check the camera, mic, and screen. You can turn all of those off um, so that they're, they're, you're muted and you're not showing your, yourself watching the, the video. Um, and uh, you can also, uh, if you have questions during, because everybody's mute, muted, uh, in the upper right, you should see a, a chat icon. And if you click on there, you can, you can type in a message. You see a couple from, well, there, so there's a private, but uh, in the chat, chat feature will allow you to to send something to everyone a brief message and uh when when keith is done presenting we can look at those and, and ask some other questions until our hour thank, <laughs> thank you that one on mute okay keith take it away okay can you hear me Stephen? yes okay great um all right well welcome uh everybody and, and thanks to comms for inviting me to present on this topic and thanks to you all for tuning in on a, on a Monday. Um, so yeah, as, uh, as Mark said, my name is Keith Bauman Gregson. I uh, help co-lead the Freshwater Harmful Algal Bloom Program for the California State Water Resources Control Board. Um, and Marissa Van Dyke is uh, the other co-conspirator with me on this topic. And today I'll be sharing a little bit about uh, cyanobacterial harmful algal blooms, uh, providing some background on their ecology and um, dynamics and then talking about uh, what our program does to help uh, address their impacts to water quality in California. All right, so there we go. Uh, so you, uh, you all may have heard the phrase that whiskey is for drinking, but water is for fighting over. And so in California, as in many other parts of the world, we have anthropogenic alterations to watersheds that are degrading water quality and aquatic ecosystem health. And so since rivers and lakes are collection points on the landscape, they are particularly sensitive to anthropogenic impacts. And so it's no surprise that these aquatic systems are struggling when you see that water extractions, dams, nutrient pollution, invasive species, and harvesting have all been increasing throughout the 20th century. I'm going to switch over the laser pointer too. Um, yep. And so one of the consequences of these anthropogenic modifications to aquatic ecosystems is an increase in harmful algal blooms. And HABs in fresh water are often caused by cyanobacteria. And cyanobacteria, or blue-green algae, are photosynthetic bacteria that are present in aquatic systems across the world. And they usually persist at low biomass, but under certain environmental conditions, they can bloom and begin to dominate the ecosystem. And so harmful algal blooms have many impacts. They can change the physical conditions of the water body and the way it functions. And this can negatively impact other organisms, such as when dissolved oxygen levels drop and cause a fish to die. Uh, the bloom also degrades the aesthetics of a water body. 
And then most consequentially, cyanobacteria produce toxins, which are dangerous to humans and animals. And so these toxins then affect drinking water, recreation, and agriculture that are connected to a water body experiencing a HAB. But first, let's get some terms straight. The language around HABs can be a little bit confusing. Already in this talk, I've used the word algae, blue-green algae, and cyanobacteria. So are these referring to the same thing or different things? Well, let's start with algae. This term was coined many centuries ago to describe simple photosynthetic organisms without roots, stems, and seeds. Basically things that were green but not land plants. And so from the 1600s to the 1800s, people thought that these organisms were all closely related. And so here is a tree of life drawn by Ernst Haeckel, one of Darwin's contemporaries and a major player in biology in the 20th century. And this red box over here highlights his archephyta. And in this group, he lumped together ocean seaweed, freshwater algae, and a blue-green alga called nostoc. Well, if we fast forward to the 20th century, scientists realized that all these organisms in the group algae were not similar. And this was especially true for the blue-green algae, which were not at all closely related to the other algae. Blue-green algae were actually a type of, cyanobac of a bacteria called cyanobacteria. And so on this contemporary tree of life, you can see the cyanobacteria over here on the left. And then way over here on the right, in this blue circle, are the other types of algae. And animals, which are all of us, are way down here by the star. And so if you think about the amount of diversity that just exists within the animal kingdom, and then look at the distance between animals and algae, and then algae and cyanobacteria, you can get a sense of how drastically different some of these organisms can be that were previously lumped together into the group called algae. And so currently it's more common to call blue-green algae by their scientific name, cyanobacteria, but we still call them harmful algal blooms, even if cyanobacteria are the organism causing the bloom. And so now that we've cleared up the language, let's focus on cyanobacteria. As I mentioned previously, cyanobacteria are a photosynthetic bacteria. They evolved over two billion years ago and have had a major impact on the development of many of Earth's eco ecosystems. So here's a picture of cyanobacteria and a filamentous algae. And you can see that the filamentous algae uh, tend to be larger than, the, larger than the cyanobacteria and also have more structure because their cells are more complex than the relatively simple bacteria. Now, I just said that cyanobacteria have had a big impact on the Earth's history. And that's because they were the first organisms to evolve what's called oxygenic photosynthesis. So that's where you take sunlight and you turn it into sugar and oxygen. And the very early Earth's atmosphere had no oxygen at all in it. And so this graph here shows the age of the Earth on the x-axis starting from the Earth's formation 4.5 billion years ago. And then you can see here around 3 billion years ago the first oxygen producing bacteria appear, which are the cyanobacteria. And this blue line on the y-axis is showing oxygen concentrations in the atmosphere. And it's about between 2 and 2.5 billion years ago that what the geologists call the Great Oxidation Event occurred. And this is the first time that oxygen is recorded in rocks, ancient rocks in the Earth. And all this oxygen um, came from the cyanobacteria photosynthesizing and just pumping out oxygen into that prehistoric Earth atmosphere. And so now today, with these elevated oxygen uh, concentrations we have, uh, that's all attributed to um, the evolution of this oxygenic photosynthesis by cyanobacteria. So it's a pretty amazing impact that these uh, microscopic organisms have had on um, the trajectory of Earth's evolution. Now, cyanobacteria are a diverse group of organisms. And uh, the term cyanobacteria is a pretty broad taxonomic term. So it's similar to the, uh, the term mammals. So you could ask the question, well, what does a mammal look like? And you'd say, well, do you mean a mouse or an elephant? Mammals look different and can do quite different things. And the same is true for cyanobacteria. And so here's some microscopic images of cyanobacteria. And so some are single celled and can live together in uh, colonies and others, uh, species are filamentous. And so in the filamentous ones, each one of these vertical lines is an individual cell wall, and these cells are all stacked together to form the filament. 
And so with many different types of cyanobacteria, when we're actually responding to blooms, we are identifying which species are dominant in the bloom so that we can then infer more about the ecology of the bloom and how that bloom is functioning. As I mentioned, cyanobacteria have been on Earth for a very long time, billions of years. And so they've had plenty of time to evolve, to inhabit all sorts of different environments on Earth. They are primarily aquatic and found in both fresh and ocean waters. However, some have evolved to live on desert soils as biotic crusts. They are also found on all the continents and are some of the dominant biomass in Antarctic lakes and rivers. Cyanobacteria also exist in symbioses with other organisms, such as lichen, which are an association between fungus and either algae or cyanobacteria. And in many of these environments, cyanobacteria exist as part of a healthy ecosystem, often at low biomass. And in fresh waters, it's primarily due to anthropogenic changes to a watershed that cause the cyanobacteria to bloom. And so here in California, we have HABs all over the state. You can see here that the voluntary reports submitted to our office have increased each year since the program began in 2016. And on the map, I've highlighted some of the notable bloom locations that characterize the diversity of HABs across the state. So they span the entire length of the state, from the northern um, border with Oregon up on the Klamath River, down to our border with Mexico, to, uh, where urban parks in San Diego will experience blooms. They also span a large elevation gradient where we can have blooms along the coast, such as Pinto Lake, uh, which sends cyanotoxins into Monterey Bay, and then all the way up to greater than 6,000 feet in the Sierra Nevada, such as Lake Crowley uh, over here on the east side, which is also a part of uh, Los Angeles water delivery system from the Owens Valley. In the north coast, we have uh, cyanobacteria growing in the rivers, such as the Eel River and the Trinity and the Russian rivers. Um, and then down in Southern California, cyanobacteria and cyanotoxins have been detected in almost every coastal estuary along the coast down here. And there's been a lot of work into the cyanotoxins at the land-sea interface in Southern California. And they also occur in every month of the year, uh, though they definitely peak in the summer. And so this highlights that you know, we have such a big state with so many different ecological regions. We, uh, we really do face a, a diverse set of, uh, of bloom locations and environmental contexts that, uh, that is quite striking um, uh, when you consider um, our landscape diversity to, to what other states, um, uh, that it, the diversity that exists in other states. And I wanted to pay um, particular attention to uh, cyanobacterial mats. And so, um, in both rivers and lakes, um, cyanobacteria can grow as mats attached to rocks and cobbles or sand on the bottom of the water body. And we refer to these as benthic mats because they grow in the benthic or bottom habitat of the water body. And these have quite a different look to open water blooms in lakes uh, because those, these open water blooms will often form the familiar pea soup or spilled paint look. But instead, these uh, mats can grow when the rest of, the, of a river might look quite clear and pristine. And so in the top right, I've got this image of the Eel River, which looks like a pretty um, nice, clean, clear water river. But then if you were to drop your camera or your snorkel mask under the water, you might see like, wow, there is a lot of algal biomass under there. And a good chunk of it involves cyanobacteria. Uh, and so um, this sort of disconnect between the overall clarity of the water and the presence of the potentially toxic mats creates some messaging challenges for us because much of the language we use to communicate to the public about HABs doesn't really apply as much to these benthic mats. And so as these mats are growing, um, they, uh, uh, they're photosynthesizing and the oxygen from the photosynthesis will get trapped in their mucus, which forms all these bubbles, which hopefully you can see in these images. And as the mats get old, uh, they then grow weaker and more easily, easily detach. And the detached mats then float to the surface because they have all these bubbles trapped in them. And uh, these floating clumps then travel downstream. And so here's some photographs of what these detached mats can look like. The photograph on the left here is an underwater photo looking upstream in the Eel, Rock, from the, in the Eel River in summer. And all this material at the top are floating clumps of cyanobacteria that are staying buoyant due to the trapped oxygen. So these clumps float downstream and then uh, 
they will then sort of accumulate uh, in slow flowing sections of the river. And so here is an image of a swimming hole on the Van Dusen River in Humboldt County. And all this material in the foreground here are uh, these floating clumps that have now just accumulated in the eddy of the swimming hole. And this is then a popular place for people to go swimming and recreate. And so you have this situation where this potentially toxic material is being delivered and accumulating at the places where humans are recreating in the, in the, in the water body. And so this mobile nature of benthic mats, especially in rivers, highlights one of the management challenges of cyanobacteria in rivers um, that's different from the planktonic blooms that might apply, uh, occur in lakes. So shifting gears back to lakes again, uh, we know that it's common to find cyanobacteria in ecosystems, but uncommon for them to dominate and bloom. And so what environmental conditions tend to result in blooms? Well, water bodies are complex, as many of you are aware, and so many factors could be interacting to drive the bloom. Although generally, it's water bodies with warm waters, high light, high nutrients, and a stable water column that are most likely to see a bloom. Um, and so we have these pretty broad generalizations uh, and understanding of cyanobacterial uh, factors that drive the blooms, but because of their complexity, it can still require a lot of um, water body specific uh, sampling and understanding to really ensure you have an adequate understanding of what's driving a bloom in, in your water body of interest. And so to highlight that, this is a figure uh, that was uh, uh, created by looking at um, an assessment of many different lakes. And then the authors were look, doing some statistical correlations between nutrient conditions in the lake and temperature conditions in the lakes and what uh, the dominant taxa were in the lakes. And these colors, um, and I need to apologize because the authors chose an unfortunate set of color palette where it's very difficult to understand, to distinguish interaction and nutrients. Um, but uh, uh, what you can see here is that for different taxa, they found a stronger response where some taxa, such as anabina, were strongly associated with nutrient conditions in, in the water body, while other taxa, such as microcystis, were strongly associated with temperature. And so this highlights that with um, that, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to um, paint with too broad a brushstroke when it comes to harmful algal blooms and really understanding what the driver is. You really need to figure out what taxa are in a water body, um, what the nutrient temperature, environmental conditions are, hydrology is, um, before you can really kind of feel more confident that you're, you're identifying the correct environmental driver. So at this point, you are probably wondering uh, how we can prevent or stop blooms from occurring. Well, as I was just going over, these blooms are complex and might often be pretty water body specific in their um, sort of the mechanisms causing them to form. So uh, there's really no one size fits all method to, uh, to mitigation, but um, I'm, I'm gonna highlight these three broad technique categories for mitigating blooms. The first are uh, physical treatments, which involve changing the uh, physical environment so that blooms um, are, are, have a harder time forming. And so this basically involves um, some form of aeration or mechanical uh, mixing to, uh, to affect the water column. There's also watershed treatments, uh, which try to reduce the loading of nutrients into the water body. And these often need to be quite holistic and operate at a pretty large scale to be effective. And there's also chemical treatments. And so you can add alum or phospholock, which decreases the amount of bioavailable nutrients in the water body. Or if you already have a bloom that's occurred, uh, there are also chemicals that can be added to the water that will kill the cyanobacteria. And so here's a photograph of a helicopter deploying copper sulfate into a reservoir in Southern California to, to knock back a bloom. Okay, so we just spent some time describing the larger scale characteristics of cyanobacterian blooms. So now let's focus on the thing that makes them harmful, which is namely the toxins. Cyanobacteria make dozens of different types of molecules that are toxic to humans, pets, livestock, and other animals. And if you go on to count all the variants on the main molecular forms, then this number jumps into the hundreds. And so all these molecules are generally divided into four toxicological categories that affect the skin, liver, kidney, or nervous system. And in our program, we, uh, we sample and monitor for four different types of toxins, the microcystins, anatoxins, cylindrospermopsin, and saxitoxin. And you can see that um, these each have different uh, effects on the human 
and uh, animal systems. So I'm going to just do a speak briefly to each one of these different toxins. So the microcystins are a liver toxin that cause liver hemorrhaging and bleeding. And uh, they're probably the most common and most well researched and understood of the cyanotoxins. Um, they are uh, a molecule that has um, this main uh, ring of carbon and nitrogen atoms in this arm, but there's hundreds of different variants. Um, these two green circles here, you can have different amino acids binding to those circles, uh, binding to those sites, um, and that's what creates all the different variants. Their symptoms tend to occur uh, in hours to days, so it's not a particularly fast-acting toxin. The anatoxins are a neurotoxin that disrupt muscle function, so it often results in um, um, seizures or um, uh, convulsions, uh, like for pets. And there's, um, there's four variants. You have anatoxin A, homoanatoxin A, and then these dihydro ones, so dihydroanatoxin A, Dihydro and um, dihydrohomoanatoxin A. And um, it's basically there's variants in these bonds up here that, uh, um, or in these molecules up here off the main ring that cause these different variants. And in contrast to microcystin, this one acts quite rapidly, uh, often in minutes to hours. And so we tend to get a lot of, uh, or most of our dog deaths or dog illness reports are associated with anatoxin uh, because it acts so quickly, it's often when people are still at a water body that a dog might start to convulse, and so it's easier to tie it back to a potential cyanotoxin exposure compared to a, um, a symptoms that might occur you know, a couple days later. Saxitoxin is an additional neurotoxin, um, and this is produced by both with cyanobacteria and marine algae, and so in the marine world, it's referred to as paralytic, paralytic shellfish poisoning, and so there's a lot of um, uh, marine research and marine monitoring that's done on um, this toxin, and it is also a class of toxin. There's a number of derivatives off of the main saxitoxin molecule. Um, in the marine system, it often accumulates in, uh, in shellfish as well, so that's one of the concerns is uh, getting this um, toxin through sh by consuming ocean shellfish. And then lastly, there's cylindrospermopsin, which is another liver and kidney toxin. Um, it is relatively stable in the environment and also has less variance than these other molecules I've been showing. Um, and one of the things I wanted to highlight by showing uh, this molecular structure um, is that these are, each molecule, it's, it's, it's a different chemical structure. And so when researching and thinking about um, drivers, about why um, cyanobacteria are producing these toxins, um, you know, we, we really can't lump these together. Each toxin needs to be considered independently, and, and uh, we need to understand um, what that molecule is doing uh, within the cyanobacterial cell and what environmental factors are um, uh, affecting the, the, that cell um, and the amount of toxins that it produces. So uh, it's, there's a lot of kind of dimensions to, to consider when, when thinking about cyanotoxins, which is, which is why we still are just barely scratching the surface of, um, of this, this topic. And another uh, important uh, consideration is uh, where the toxins are, are residing. So um, these toxins are produced within the cells, and for most species and most toxins, the majority of the toxins uh, remain within the cells, within the cell wall. And so it's when these, tox when these cells lyse, or the cell walls or cell membranes break open, that's when then you can have this larger release of toxins out into the water column um, or out into the environment. And uh, the cell lysis can often occur in our guts and stomachs. So that's why if you consume a bunch of um, cyanobacterial cells, once they get into our stomachs, the cell walls will lyse, and that will then release the toxins um, into our stomach, where they can then be absorbed by our digestive system. And so how, um, how do we get exposed to, to these different cyanotoxins? So um, there's kind of these three routes, skin, ingestion, and inhalation. Uh, so skin, um, in addition to the toxins I've mentioned, cyanobacteria that are the cell membranes of cyanobacteria will have other proteins and, um, and molecules that will kind of react negatively with our skins. And so that will often cause people to have rashes or irritations on their skin. So um, the actual toxin molecules are not passing through our skin, but it's these other compounds that will cause us to, uh, to get irritations. And so it's primarily for the actual toxin molecules for us to get uh, um, be exposed to it. We have to actually ingest the cyanobacterial cells. And so it's dogs and children that are then most at risk 
because they're more likely to intentionally or unintentionally drink the bloom water or eat cyanobacterial mats um, compared to adults. And then inhalation is a more recent field of study. And so um, over, we, we basically know that the cyanobacteria and the cyanotoxins can get aerosolized and inhaled, but the effects of, um, of the toxins once, once they've been inhaled are still uh, not well understood. And it, it's been receiving increasing uh, attention just in the last, last few years. So expect our, our understanding of this to, to grow a lot more, um, hopefully within five years or so, we should have a better sense. All right, and then cytotoxin pro cytotoxins are produced um, due to the genes within the, within the cyanobacterial cells. And so not all species and strains contain these different toxin synthesis genes. And there's no way to tell this visually. And so if you're looking at a microscope sample, a microscope image, it may be that some filaments are producing toxins and some are not. Um, and similarly, sometimes you can go out to a bloom and detect no toxins, other times it is very toxic. And this image at the bottom here shows the abundance of two different cyanobacterial strains in the Klamath River. Uh, the x-axis are the months June through December, and the y-axis is the abundance of these strains within the sample. And the different panels are different sampling sites up and down the Klamath River. So you can see that initially um, you have this period where both strains are at similar abundances, but then by the fall, uh, in December, the blue strain is basically dominating in all the samples, and the orange strain has dropped off. And so it's this population variation over time within a bloom that's what primarily drives changes in the bloom toxicity. And so this table here lists a bunch of different cyanobacterial genera on the right, and then the columns show a number of different cyanotoxins. And you can see that different genera are capable of producing different types of toxins, but then within each genera, not all species and strains are producing these toxins. So um, it is quite, quite a complex uh, landscape um, in sort of understanding why uh, toxin concentrations are changing within a bloom when you consider all these different uh, uh, variables that, that basically um, go into what the final toxin concentration is. And so the, the basic takeaway is that um, when a blooms occur, you can't tell if toxins are present without testing. So you either need to have some kind of a field toxin testing kit or submit a sample for laboratory analyses. And so without testing, the best that we can say is that uh, potentially toxigenic cyanobacteria are present in a bloom. And so um, where then are uh, these HAB illness, you know, where are these illnesses occurring in California? And so in 2018, um, uh, our office um, and the Water Board started partnering with um, the Office of Environmental Health Hazard and Assessment and Department of Public Health and Department of Fish and Wildlife to form this interagency illness group. And so now anytime we get reports of uh, potential illness related to a bloom, there's additional follow-up. Um, and interviews uh, by uh, public health staff to, to gain more information about what that situation was. So we only have two years of data. So you can see here on the left in this map, this shows the counties where either humans reported illnesses or animals, or in some cases both, we had reports of both in the county. And um, uh, we expect that this is likely an underreporting because our system is, is pretty voluntary and um, we, you know, we suspect that sometimes people aren't, aren't calling us or emailing us. Uh, but Similar to the other map I showed you of, of HABs in California, this, this is um, quite a statewide um, issue and occurrence and uh, not constrained to any one individual region of our state. Okay, so this concludes my introduction to HABs and their impact on public health and ecosystems. And so uh, we're gonna talk a little bit now about um, the California Freshwater HABs program in the water boards and how we are trying to um, address and communicate the risk of HABs to the public. And so I'll start by with a brief overview of the history of HABs research, tracking, and policy in California. So uh, in the 1970s, uh, Clear Lake, which is in Northern California, uh, had a lot of cyanobacterial blooms. And there was two researchers in the University of California, Alex Horn and Charles Goldman, who spent uh, a fair amount of time um, studying the blooms on this lake. And so it's, they, contribute a lot of really seminal uh, ecology work on and physiology work on how blooms occur. And so it's, it's pretty neat that um, you know, this lake is, uh, you know, has a pretty important place in our understanding of cyanobacterial ecology. 
Uh, however, from an agency or a public health perspective, um, HABs weren't really on the map of, of many agencies in the state. Then in the 2000s, the Klamath River, reservoirs on the Klamath River in Northern California began to bloom, and this affected uh, the tribes that uh, live along the river and, uh, and use the river for um, uh, their uh, cultural practices and tribal uses, and drew a lot of attention to the issue, but there wasn't much leadership from any of the state agencies. So then in 2006, the California Cyanohab Network, or the CCHAB Network, formed, and this was a multi-entity network of agency uh, folks, um, the tribes, academics, NGOs, and they were coming together because there wasn't really much leadership from a state agency and there was a need for more consistency in um, how HABs are being monitored and messaged out to the public. So this group came together to try and standardize and um, create more consistency uh, uh, for HABs research and HABs monitoring in California. And then in 2014, we had the Toledo, Ohio water crisis, uh, you know, um, where the city of Toledo's water was shut down due to a bloom on Lake Erie. This was a national uh, event, uh, or this drew a lot of, um, uh, drew a national spotlight to HABs, and a lot of states then started, um, you know, paying more attention to, to the topic within their state boundaries, and the same was true for California. And so that then culminated in 2016 with the release of the FHAB strategy document and the formal tracking of HABs by our office. And then more, most recently in 2019, at the end of last year, Governor Newsom signed a bill to uh, formalize this program within the, within the water board. So we kind of talked about it, how from 2016 to 2019, we've been operating with a lowercase p program. And now in 2019 and moving forward with this bill, we have a capital P program. And uh, to highlight the CCHAB network, uh, it is a work group under the Water Quality Monitoring Council. And uh, you can see here below some of its participants participating entities. It's quite quite diverse, and um, it's trying to con it's continuing to uh, to Im improve the coordination uh, and um, knowledge of monitoring and assessment and reporting for HABs in California. So our office works closely with this group. If anybody else is uh, interested in HABs in California and not a member or um, on the listserv, I, I strongly encourage you to get on the Lyris list and uh, attend the quarterly meetings. It's a great way to stay updated with what's happening on HABs in California. And then I work in SWAMP, which stands for the Surface Water Ambient Monitoring Program. Back in 2016, uh, it was this uh, group that was assigned the role of uh, sort of building up the, the Freshwater Harmful Algal Bloom Program. And so uh, the HABs program, its purpose is to lead freshwater HAB event response, assessment, and communication. And the focus is on recreational exposures, so in water bodies where we have drinking water, source water, protect, um, where we have drinking water as well as um, recreational uses in the water body, that we will partner with um, both the Division of Drinking Water and Drinking Water Purveyors to, uh, to help um, assess the situation and the impacts of both recreational and drinking water uses. So I'm now going to spend a little bit of time overviewing what the current status of our program looks like here in California and how we are addressing the uh, risks uh, posed by HABs to recreational beneficial uses. This here is uh, one of the key graphics from that 2016 strategy. And you can see that it, it highlighted three categories uh, for the state to uh, consider response to HAB events, ambient monitoring, and risk assessment. And since 2016, the state's been mainly working on the response to HAB events, and particularly uh, developing this infrastructure that did not exist prior to 2016, the infrastructure that would be needed to, um, to track and respond to, to bloom events. And that infrastructure currently resides on our HABs portal, uh, which, is our one, which is our website, and it's, we try to make this the one-stop shop for all things HABs related in California. Um, and uh, it has kind of four themes and four categories of information uh, on the website. And so I'm gonna talk about each of these categories here. So the first is where are HABs? So it was um, seen as a priority and very important to, to be able to communicate to the public where harmful algal blooms were occurring in the state and what the um, current knowledge about their, um, their condition were. And so that resulted in a developing a, our HAB incident reports map. And uh, this is a map that's populated, populated by our reporting system. And so we have this 
voluntary reporting system where anyone can submit a report or update by filling out the form or calling us or sending an email. And then when we receive a report, <laughs> that will um, trigger follow-up investigation by um, regional water board staff and state board staff. And then this map is then updated daily as we are um, to sort of push live any updates to the database. And let's see if I can, yeah. Great, and so here is what the website looks like. Um, yeah, there we go. So here's our map. Um, each point represents a report. Uh, it shows a different advisory level, and then when you hover over a point, you get more information about the bloom and that condition. Um, we also, in addition to the voluntary reports from the public, uh, we also have a number of partners who run monitoring programs in the state. So for example, you see a lot of points here around Clear Lake, a lot of points around Lake Isabella, um, the East Bay Regional Parks as well, um, some of their water bodies. And so these are groups where they share with us their monitoring data so that we can put this on our map and um, have a more comprehensive picture of the condition of water bodies uh, throughout the state. And so we greatly appreciate um, their partnerships and are always welcoming um, additional um, you know, groups to, to partner with us and uh, share with us their data so that we can make it as publicly available to people. We also um, have a second map um, that uses uh, satellite imagery. And so um, there are satellite sensors that can estimate the density of cyanobacteria in the water column. And so we've worked with the San Francisco Estuary Institute for the last few years to take that satellite imagery and be able to present it in a map for, um, to, look at water, um, to look at water bodies in California. Um, and so you, we, we have a map that shows this for about the 250 largest water bodies in the state because um, if water bodies are too small, the satellite can't, um, can't detect them. And so we use this to inform us where cyanobacterial blooms are developing and so we can prioritize where we should send field crews. So it's really a screening tool. We don't issue any advisories based only off of satellite data. We consider the data there um, provisional, but it has been very helpful um, and helping to allocate resources and follow up uh, with different water bodies because um, you don't have to, uh, you can very quickly understand which, which, blue, which water bodies you should be focusing your attention on. And uh, so we'll also try to pop over here. So if you click on the website, it will load up here. And so this map will load. So here's the map of California where only the largest water bodies are shown. And so you can zoom in on a water body. So we'll pick San Luis Reservoir here. And when you click on the reservoir, you can then zoom in to see the data. So here, um, each one of these little squares is a satellite pixel. And then the color associated with the pixel is an estimate of how dense the cyanobacteria in that pixel are. So as you get into the yellow and reds, you're getting a more dense bloom. Uh, you can track with these graphs, you can kind of see how blooms are developing. So in this case, so in this reservoir, we can kind of see this uptick uh, in early April in the bloom. So it's a great way to see how blooms are growing or decreasing. And then you can also zoom around in time. And so we can jump back here uh, in the past to see when blooms were denser. Um, and so you actually get this quite a nice time series of the blooms. Um, and so if anybody here is, has body, their water bodies of interest on this map, I, I definitely encourage you to, uh, to access the map uh, and hopefully it can be, be useful for you. Um, it's also possible to download the data as well. And um, I know comms, I did a webinar on remote sensing last year, and there was also a few talks on remote sensing of HABs at the, um, at the conference last October. So um, if anybody has any questions or would like to learn more about that, uh, feel free to reach out and we can share more details with you. Okay, so those are our, oh yeah, and then the last thing to note, um, just to highlight is that the imagery is not showing anything about toxin concentrations. We cannot derive that from satellite imagery. We can only get estimates of the density of cyanobacterial blooms. Okay, and so uh, we're trying to show the public and, and understand where these blooms are occurring, and then we also want to communicate to people how to stay safe when they're out of the water body. And so we have a lot of resources. Uh, we, we have a high priority on uh, communicating information out to the public. Um, and so we have a fact sheet and an FAQs page 
about um, background information on harmful algal blooms. We have a visual um, guide, a quick fact sheet for how to identify cyanobacteria from other different types of algae and organisms that grow in a water body. Uh, we have um, what we call our healthy water habits and information about human, human health and recreational health. We have information about wildlife and fish and also information for dogs and livestock and pet owners. Um, so we try to target different user groups with specific information. And uh, we're also you know, frequently doing um, webinars like this. Um, in the summertime, we get a lot of media inquiries. So uh, we're trying to, trying to get the news out as much as possible. And then we also have our advisories. Um, and so in 2016, the CCHAB network uh, developed this three-tiered uh, uh, HABs advisory system from caution, warning, and danger. And each of these are connected to a specific uh, cyanotoxin trigger level and the caution uh, and then have increasing restrictions. So the caution advises you, you know, generally to stay away from algae. The warning level says no swimming, so you shouldn't really be contacting the water. And then the danger level advises uh, no real like water body use. So beyond swimming, like don't use boats or personal watercraft um, because the toxin concentrations are quite high. And since these are all um, based off the toxin concentrations, they do, you know, they, the basic protocol is to go out, collect a sample, measure it for toxins, and then determine which uh, advisory is most appropriate. And so here's a table of our trigger levels, and we have them for three of the toxins, microcystin, anatoxin, and cylindrospermopsin. Uh, and then there's different uh, concentration triggers because each toxin has different toxicological properties, and some are more potent than others. Um, saxitoxin, which I mentioned before, um, there was no trigger level developed. And also I wanna highlight that the US EPA also has advisory levels for drinking water and recreational uh, exposures. And the recreational ones just came out uh, last year. So it's, it's quite, uh, still quite hot off the press. Um, the EPA only has them for two toxins, microcystin and cylindrospermopsin. You'll notice that the microcystin recreational level from EPA is, is pretty similar to our warning level, but for cylindrospermopsin, the EP level is closer to our danger level in California. And so there's a group in CCHAB that is considering um, sort of this interaction between the CCHAB trigger levels and the US EPA and if or how or when um, CCHAB trigger levels might be updated or revised uh, based off of the US EPA. So it's still a, quite an open conversation, um, but at some point we'll hear from them. And then uh, the response and coordination to these um, blooms is, uh, involves a lot of different um, groups and a lot of collaboration. Uh, so the basic workflow is we get our report submitted to our hotlines and uh, goes in our reporting system. We then will make those public on our map so people know um, what's going on and where, where the blooms are. But in, uh, and then it's the state board and the regional board that will uh, take the lead on uh, following up with the reporting party and understanding what the conditions are. If we have illnesses, that's when we bring in these other groups to, who are more trained to interact with veterinarians and medical professionals and conduct personal interviews. Uh, and then these agencies are then interacting with um, groups at the local level. So local health departments, water managers, land managers to coordinate the posting of the issuing of these public health advisories, press releases, the actual physical posting of signs at a water body. And then if there's um, drinking water involved, then we work with the Division of Drinking Water and water purveyors um, to make sure that they are aware of the um, potential impacts of blooms on their water delivery systems. And then over here, we have this dotted line because um, blooms are constantly changing. So there's a lot of follow-up and returning to sample and um, additional work until the bloom eventually dissipates and the signs come down. And I wanted to highlight um, toxic algal mats because these CCHAB signs that were developed in 2016 were um, primarily or were developed for uh, planktonic blooms, uh, but we know that there are also mats out there. And so just recently at the end of last year um, and then this year, we, um, we a group in CCHAB developed algal mat signs. And so um, we have a general awareness sign and then this um, trigger level sign. And so these will be going live on the HABS portal, hopefully within about within the month. Um, we're also going to be adding an educational web page about toxic algal mats. We have this posting guidance flowchart that will be um, 
which will go out. And so um, if anybody is has water bodies where they suspect um, mats might be, uh, so our cytotoxins are being produced in mats, whether it be a river or a lake, uh, we're excited about these resources and hope that it helps with our messaging to the public. And so please feel free to contact me if you are interested um, in posting these general awareness signs or would like to learn more about toxic algal mats. Um, and uh, um, yeah, we are, this, is, this is great because last year it was um, a challenge. The few times we had um, toxins and algal mats come in and through our bloom reports, um, we did feel a little bit constrained in, in our ability to message appropriately because we didn't have great resources um, for this type of a context. So stay tuned for these to go live uh, within the next few weeks. So that's um, an overview of, of the advisories in California. Um, we also on the portal have information about collecting samples. Um, and so we uh, sort of recommend this, a tiered approach to assess blooms and cyanotoxins. So this would start with visual monitoring so that you are you know, kind of aware of, of what your water body looks like. Once you start to suspect a bloom, you would collect a sample. And then you can use um, these sort of like tiered screening methods of microscope ID and also looking at cytotoxin genes with, with qPCR to determine if, if your, um, the taxa within your sample are capable of producing toxins. So these two methods are cheaper than an actual chemical toxin test. So then if you determine that, um, yes, it's likely that the toxins could be produced, you can then send, um, send your sample off for toxin analysis. And then when you get the results back, determine what advisory should be issued. Um, and then as, as usual, you sort of have these revisits to assess the changing water conditions. And um, there's, we have this whole SOP for collecting samples. So if you um, if some health and safety, um, identifying this, the toxins, SOPs for the sample collection, data sheets, COCs. So if, if you are um, wanting to find out more, or find yourself in a situation where you need to collect samples, please you can turn to the, the portal and, and email us and we can follow up with you all. Oh, my apologies. <laughs> Sorry. There we go. Okay, almost back. <laughs> Sorry, I have an automatic program that runs every day that updates all the blooms that have been updated in the last two weeks and that program just ran. So my apologies for that. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, that um, sort of covers the, uh, our, our past and our present. So what about the future of our program? Um, as I mentioned, we have this HAB, this um, Assembly Bill 834 was just signed by the governor in September. And so this now creates an uppercase P program in the water boards. So we'll be increasingly increasing our coordination with other departments and agencies in the state. Uh, this bill kind of can be summarized by these key mandates of um, event response, which we've, we've basically been doing since 2016. Uh, monitoring and assessment. So this is a newer um, mandate for us now, is thinking about uh, monitoring, uh, identifying and prioritizing at-risk water bodies, uh, more research and tool development, which we have currently been funding, but now we'll have more resources to increase our funding and work on this, and then providing outreach and educational materials. And so that's also something we have been doing since 2016 and will continue to do. And so um, we were, um, See, our, uh, there was a bit of a wet blanket thrown on this um, impact of this bill due to the coronavirus. We now expect the California's budget to look to be quite um, bleak and constrained as we're responding to coronavirus. So um, we may have to wait a little bit longer for um, more financial uh, resources to be devoted to this topic, um, but hopefully that will come uh, with next year's budget. Um, on the topic of monitoring, we've been working with um, scientists at the Southern California Coastal Watershed Research Project to create a uh, monitoring strategy. So similar to that strategy that came out in 2016, which recommended monitoring as a key area, we are now turning our attention to that. And this will also help us meet the mandate of the AB 834 bill. And so that document should come out later this year. Uh, and then once, it, once it's been, um, once it's out, we'll now have a clearer roadmap for what a monitoring program could look like in California um, that is um, coordinated and, and partially funded by the state water boards. And so then we'll be going out trying to get funding for that program and um, sort of develop partnerships and collaborations. Um, and so that's another exciting development. And then lastly, um, we received some funding recently to print out durable signs of our 
have uh, advisories, which we are trying to gift for free to different entities in the state. So we have about 1,100 advisory signs and 500 of these general awareness signs um, that are 18 by 24 inches and made of three millimeter PVC. And uh, um, we, are, um, we have a Google form application. So if anybody, whether you be a water body manager or an environmental health group, or um, please, if, if you would think it would be helpful to have some signs given to you, uh, please fill out our form. And my plan was to uh, drop this link in the chat in a moment um, so that folks can look for that there. Um, or you can send me an email and I can send it to you. Uh, but we are accepting, uh, asking people to fill out the form by next Monday. Um, and then we'll go through and be in touch with folks on um, the amount of signs that, that we can give them all. So that uh, concludes uh, my talk. Thank you all for um, for coming, tuning in and listening. And uh, I haven't been paying attention to the chat, but if there's any questions in the chat now, I can answer them. Or if um, Stephen or Mark want to field verbal questions, happy to do that too. Here's my email. And uh, you can always check out our water quality portal or our HABS portal here as well. And thank you all for your attention. Cool. Yeah, thanks, Keith. Um, I think how we'll do this, um, since we have like 177 people on right now, is we'll keep everyone muted and I'll be fielding questions through the chat app. So if you do have questions, please uh, enter them into the chat. And I'll start with the question we got from Stephen, which is, does the caution warning danger system of the signs work in practice, given the fast rate of HAB growth relative to the lake manager's ability to detect and react? Mm. Um, uh, yeah, so we recognize that there is usually some kind of a time lag. Um, uh, so, you know, by the time you get samples out, you're always kind of posting something based off of a, a bloom that was a few days ago. Um, some of these monitoring groups, like the State Water Project monitors um, every, uh, uh, let's see, bi-weekly and then sometimes weekly, and you do see these advisories shift over time. So it's, I, um, we definitely recognize that we're not capturing the like, um, the instantaneous uh, um, condition, but we do at least see the ability for there to be some flexibility um, in, uh, in the advisories changing based off of giving um, uh, um, bloom, bloom conditions. Um, but uh, um, yeah, that, that you, you raise kind of that fundamental difficulty with with the, um, the toxins. You know, unless somebody can, until we get a, a test that's you know field based and can give you a toxin turnaround time in, in a couple hours, we're always going to sort of be a few days behind the bloom. Let All me right. um, let me just jump in, jump in. So uh, for those who uh, didn't hear at the beginning, uh, there is a chat feature that Mark's referring to. So in the upper right of the window for GoToMeeting, you'll see a little chat icon and you click on that and you can type in a question at the bottom that'll be the easiest way to track them so next we had uh from dan deeds at the bureau of reclamation um dan says assembly bill 834 also asks the state water board to recommend actions to protect water quality and public health from habs including statutory and regulatory changes can you please speak to what sorts of actions these might be yeah, so um, AB 834 was initially introduced with a bill called AB 835, which was um, specifically about developing water quality standards um, for HABs um, by the Division of, of Water Quality. AB 835 um, basically did not make it through the legislature. And so um, that was going to be the um, more of the regulatory aspect. And so um, Currently, the bill doesn't have as much regulatory teeth in it as it was initially um, thought that that, that two-bill pairing was going to have. Um, so the Division of Water Quality um, does have cyanotoxins on its um, list of things to consider for um, standards development. Um, it's not currently at the top of that priority list, um, but we in our office and, and elsewhere have conversations um, on standards development and that will be um as you mentioned that that will kind of be a, a probably you know the next big game changer in this topic for california um, and even nationwide as well if, if the epa were to have more specific criteria um uh so um yeah i guess i i, I can speak to that and then um you know follow-up questions would be would be happy to 
to um, to email and could get you in touch with folks at Division of Water Quality as well, because um, that's a bit more under in their wheelhouse. Cool. All right. Next, next we have one from BMC. It's can you talk briefly about the potential for surface water toxins to impact groundwater? Uh, yeah, that's funny you mentioned. We had a number of questions about that this last year. Um, it, there, let's see, there are, so we had a couple um, uh, folks ask our office about that um, earlier this year with, with some projects. Um, it does seem like in the literature, there are a few studies where people have been able, have found some cyanotoxins in, um, in groundwater wells nearby water bodies with, um, with blooms in them, it, um, or they've done like laboratory experiments pumping toxin water through like a, a column of sediment. Um, it feels like the data is still relatively sparse. Um, we do know that toxins degrade um, over time. Um, there's microbes that can degrade them, uh, sunlight degrades them, water quality, you know, condition or water conditions will degrade them. So um, it seems like we, we probably need to increase our um, data set and there's probably more um, sampling and research that needs to be done to, to really understand um, what that impact is and it's probably going to vary by um, by system um, but if you have a groundwater um, well and you can pull up samples um, it, uh, you know you could conceivably test test for toxins there cool. uh, Ralph asks uh, have there been confirmed human or dog deaths attributed to HABs uh, so in California um, Dogs, yes, uh, we have pretty strong, a number of, of very strongly associated um, deaths, um, and then uh, some other that it's a little bit more suspect. Um, humans, um, not in California, um, and I don't remember offhand the global um, look. I, I do remember, um, I was recently reading an article from 2017 that came out where there was a 20-month-old um, child who was recreating where there was a bloom and um, ingested material which led to liver failure and a liver transplant but if I remember I'm pretty sure that the child survived but a pretty serious um, serious reaction um, and pretty you know, was like hospitalized with um, liver failure due to microsystem poisoning um, so uh, um, but but in California we're not aware of any deaths due of human deaths due to HABs Okay, uh, Matt asks, uh, what's the source of the satellite data that you're using for the web maps? Yes, um, I'll just post that chat. So it's from Sentinel-3, and I actually wrote 3B, but it's, it's 3A, I just typoed. Um, so Sentinel-3A is a, sat is a European satellite. Um, the sensor is called Olchi, um, and uh, the data comes from NOAA. So there's a, uh, a NOAA, USGS, and EPA have this group called Cyan, the Cyanobacterial Assessment Network, and um, they have been working on remote sensing of data and um, uh, have that data set. And so we connect to the NOAA F, uh, servers and get the um, upload from them each day. Um, and uh, I can follow up with more on that if anybody, uh, I can send you some publications and, and links there. Um, John asks, can cyanotoxins and their effects persist even after the visual signs of the algae bloom are gone? Uh, yes, they can. So, uh, as I mentioned in that slide about the, um, the cell lysis, so you can have situations where as a bloom has is dissipating, those cells are dying and releasing the dissolved toxins. So now you just have molecules floating around dissolved in the water. And so you can get um, uh, detections of toxins as the bloom dissipates. Um, and then also from um, benthic sources, you can have situations where you have the algal mats producing toxins. Some of those toxins are leaking out of the mat and can be detectable in the water column um, and uh, transported downstream. Uh, South Tahoe PUD asks, are there specific months and or water temperatures that water managers should be on the lookout for for microcystin blooms? Uh, yeah, good good question. So that kind of gets to that, um, you know, a little bit of like the, we have these general um, patterns and trends for, favorable conditions for cyanobacteria, um, but then also the specific way your water body works. Um, so um, it's usually, I, the cyanobacteria tend to 
in terms of temperature, like outcompete um, or grow faster than diatoms as you kind of get into the 20s. Um, oh, sorry, 20 degrees Celsius. And I apologize. I think in Celsius when it comes to water, <laughs> water comps, that's I guess like the 70s in, in Fahrenheit. Um, uh, in terms of months of year, um, the sunlight is something that's um, affecting their growth rate. So summers when we usually see things peak, but as I mentioned, we can have, because we're in California, we have a dry climate where, uh, in some, where part of us is desert, we, um, we can have blooms all year round. Um, and so if we have a really a milder winter with that's sunnier um, and fewer rainstorms, we, we can still see um, blooms persist. So I would, um, you know, maybe it, different than just thinking about months. It's, it's maybe more like how, um, how warm and sunny has my weather been? And if I've had a long period of warm, sunny weather, then that's when I probably want to start be thinking about it. And um, so that might be, you know, an April or May if it's a really dry year. And it's definitely always going to be the summertime because um, it doesn't rain too much here in the summer. Cool. All right. Well, it looks like we're just past one now. Um, so yeah, I wanted to thank Keith a lot for a great presentation. And if you guys have additional questions, feel free to um, send an email to him. Uh, you can see his email right there on the on the screen. And um, yeah, definitely stay on the lookout for more Calm's web webinars. We're planning on having at least two more in 2020. So yeah, thank you all for coming. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Stephen.